I'm Carl King, and this is the Carl King Podcast, where we learn about music, filmmaking, and the other creative arts. To support this podcast, head over to patreon.com slash Carl King and join for just $1 or $5 per month. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. Special thank you to my illusionist $51 level patrons, both Hank Howard III and Chiao Deeb. Quick shout out to my music endorsements, Vienna Symphonic Library, Fractal Audio, Ernie Ball Strings, Tune Track, and Millennia Media. Now let's get this episode beginned. Very good friends of Carl King, I have three brief Carl King the Human updates. Number one, this past week I finished both the Rough Piano Sketch Score and my so-called text animatic for my new animated TV show, Dragon Tooth Inn. And I sent it off to Lance Myers to get started on the real animatic. There is still plenty of work to be done, but the major pieces are in place. I'm hoping to be able to release the full-length animatic with finished audio in the next couple of months. You can hear rough versions of that inside my Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Carl King. Number two, we went to Disneyland last week with Joni Brosis and Cole Johnson, two of my voice actors from my previous animated project, That Monster Show. Now, some of you may know that I have some PTSD and an extreme sensitivity to environmental sound. When I'm out for a long time, especially around crowds, I can get pretty anxious and unhappy. So I figured out a trick. I wore earplugs and a set of bone conduction headphones. And since it was cold out, I concealed those under my winter hat and I listened to 20th century classical piano music the whole time. And when someone would talk to me, I would just press pause. And then when done talking, I'd go right back to my piano music safe space. I also took long breaks by myself to wander around and relax while the rest of the group went on some rides. And it all worked out very well for me, although some people did ask if something was wrong. Unfortunately, I forgot to explain my behavior in advance so people would know what to expect. But anyway, I plan to use this trick again. And third, today's episode features my analytical commentary on David Lynch's Blue Velvet. And I had no idea the composer Angelo Badalamenti passed away as I was finalizing this episode. So rest in peace to such a great composer. This E minor, major 7 chord, is for him. And now, let's get into the musical analysis of the week. This week, we have Travolta, also known as quote-unquote, by Mr. Bungle from their 1991 self-titled album. By the way, if you haven't heard it, I did an orchestral medley of songs from that album, and you can find it on my YouTube channel. It includes sections of Travolta, Slowly Growing Deaf, Carousel, My ASS Is On Fire, Love Is A Fist, and Dead Goon, all played with orchestral sounds. And I will put a link to that in the show notes. Now, within the world of music, I'm finding that the older I get, the more I only care about composition, which is maybe why solo piano interests me so much. It's clean and it's direct. There's no hiding behind timbres and production and effects. And of course, I still care a lot about drum solos, but if the composition behind a piece of music doesn't grab me, I just don't care. All the effects and emotional mouth sounds are meaningless to me. Now, I don't know why exactly this is, but composition is the last thing we ever talk about. In interviews, composers and musicians almost never talk about the actual notes. You ever notice that? 
They'll talk about mysterious things like feelings and intuition, and then they'll even talk about their equipment. But I'm here to say, let's talk about the actual notes, because Mr. Bungle's musical notes were a compositional gateway for me. The moment I heard them, it was a new world. I understood just enough of what they were doing to follow them into 20th century composition because that record had just enough 20th century composition elements for someone like me. I was ready for it. It's basically a rock band with some of that stuff sprinkled in. But it's nowhere near the level of Stravinsky or Bartok or Prokofiev and so on. Yet all of these years later, I'm still trying to understand what Mr. Bungle were doing. I still take those songs apart to see what they were made out of. And it's possible they spent less time writing it than I have spent analyzing it. But who cares? So let's put on our music theory socks and talk about those notes used in Travolta, also known as quote unquote. In the intro to the song, we get a heavy three note motif with the notes F sharp, E flat, and D. And I'm going to come back to that motif later, after we talk more about the verse. And in the verse, I originally thought those two chords used were a pair of augmented chords a half step apart. That would have been F augmented, spelled F, A, C sharp, and E augmented, spelled E, G sharp, and B sharp. But in my previous interview, Trey corrected me that they are actually two minor major seven chords. So it's a D minor major seven and a D flat minor major seven. Or you could spell that chord as a C sharp minor major seven. Same sound, your choice. Now I had been overlooking the note played by the bass guitar because minor major seven chords just aren't a part of my typical vocabulary. And I was fooled by the sound of it because the top three notes do indeed form an augmented triad. So here's that D minor major seven. It's a minor triad, one, flat three, five, or D, F, A, with a major seven or C sharp on the top. And according to rumors on the internet, it can be found in both the melodic minor and the harmonic minor scales. You might know it as a sort of spy chord. And Wikipedia calls it a Hitchcock chord due to its use by Bernard Herrmann in Psycho. So to review, The first chord is D minor major seven with the notes D, F, A, and C sharp. And the second chord is a half step below that, a D flat minor major seven. And that's spelled D flat, F flat, A flat, and C. Now for the heck of it, if you were to overlay these two chords and move them up a half step, you would get the notes D, E flat, F, F sharp, A, B flat, and C sharp. And the octave would be D. And those scale degrees would be one, flat two, flat three, flat four, five, flat six, and seven. And then the octave on the top. Now let's just pretend that this is a seven note scale and we will call it the D Travolta scale and it would sound like this. I sent this over to Dale Turner for his take on it And he said that it is almost the augmented scale, which is a six note hexatonic scale that sounds like this. 
So this alleged Travolta scale would be the augmented scale with an added flat two. Which makes things more confusing. If anyone knows another name for this Travolta scale, please let me know. Anyway, setting aside that alleged Travolta scale for now, I am going to use those two chords as the harmonic context. D minor major 7 and D flat minor major 7. I'm going to relate the other instruments to those two chords. Now, let's investigate the bass line happening underneath them. It uses five pitches played in this order. D, B flat, A, F sharp, and E flat. And then it returns to D. But does that bass line go with the chords from a music theory standpoint? Well, the first two bass notes are D and B flat, and they are played under that D minor major seven. And the notes in the D minor major seven again are D, F, A, and C sharp. So no, that B flat technically does not belong under that chord. So it's kind of a tension note, which leads down a half step to A under the next chord. And that next chord is D flat minor major seven. To review, the notes in that chord are D flat, F flat, A flat, and C. So that A in the bass also does not go in the second chord, and it is played on the downbeat. So the bass has only played three notes so far, and two of them are not part of the chords. The next bass note is F sharp, which is also not in that second chord. It would be the 11th of that chord. So it's not an expected chord tone. And the next and final note of the bass line in the verse is E flat, which would be a ninth over D flat. So out of those five bass notes, only one, the D on beat one, theoretically belongs with those chords. So the bass line and the chords are in their own separate harmonic universes, roughly centered around D. And you could think of this as polymodal. And there are two reasons why I think this sounds okay within the context of the song. Number one, the parts are already so dissonant that anything kind of goes. And number two, the bass line is in a super low register. Now, if you were to put them in a closer register, those dissonant intervals might clash more. Here it is with both of them in a high register. And here it is with both of them in a very low register. Now, I want to point out that the bass line itself could be considered to be implying a D minor and an E flat diminished. And if you were to play those two chords instead, it would sound like this. Or it fits pretty well with a D minor and an A7. And in that case, the last note of the line, E flat, is a flat nine leading down to D again as a grace note. Another point of interest, the music of Mr. Bungle has lots of riffs or sequences of notes that aren't quite chromatic and not quite diatonic. They don't fit neatly into any sort of scale or arpeggio. It's sort of like mini 12 tone or 12 tone junior. They'll put together a small three or five note group separated by half steps and minor thirds. And remember what I called the Travolta scale? Well, those five notes of the bass line all exist in that imaginary Travolta scale. But it's a half step down. Meaning those keyboard chords and bass line 
would actually be in the same bizarre scale, but still rooted in two different keys a half step apart. And to get the notes of the bass line from the Travolta scale, you simply leave out the F, which is the flat three, and the C sharp, which is the seventh. So if you take the notes of the verse bass line and play them in ascending order, they come out to D, E flat, F sharp, A, and B flat. Now let's take a look at those intervals from D to E flat, that is a half step, E flat to F sharp is equivalent to a minor third, although in this case I think technically it's considered a augmented second, and F sharp to A is a minor third, and A to B flat is a half step. The shape of that sequence of notes looks like a diminished triad with a half step added to each side. And remember, as I was saying, Mr. Bungle really liked half steps and minor thirds. So this small group of five notes made from those intervals is not only a metal thing to do, it's a way of creating an atonal sound without using all 12 chromatic notes. And just for fun, here is that sequence of notes in reverse. B flat, A, F sharp, E flat, and D. Which means the notes of Trevor Dunn's bass line here are symmetrical and can be played in retrograde and inversion, and it is the same formula. So here's the question. Were these two parts, the keyboards and the bass line, intentionally created from that same imaginary Travolta scale, but a half step off? We don't know yet. Now it's highly likely I'm finding a pattern in total chaos, but even if they came up with these parts intuitively, I think they might actually gravitate towards using this tonality very often. I find that our tastes themselves will be patterny, much like Devin Townsend using sharp four and flat six in everything, maybe without knowing it. Musicians who don't have a theoretical understanding tend to repeat themselves when writing music by ear. They'll sort of rediscover the same music time and again. And the difference is that musicians like Trace Bruins and Trevor Dunn could tell you theoretically what they are doing and how they are <laughs> repeating themselves by using their favorite chords and tonalities. Now, by the way, remember that three note intro motif at the beginning of the song? Well, it shows up in the descending line at the end of each phrase in the bass guitar during the verse. It's those three notes descending, including D. It goes F sharp, E flat, and D. The same notes at the end of the bass guitar's verse phrase. Now, did they extract those three notes from the bass line and use them as the intro? Or was it a coincidence? We do not know. Okay, now that we have two different harmonic universes doing their own thing, roughly centered on D, let's take a look at the third voice, which is literally Mike Patton's voice, singing a melody. Over the first chord, he sings the words, all behold the. So over that D minor major seven, he sings the notes F, down to a D, back up to F, and a higher D. And hey, they theoretically fit over the chord. because they are chord tones. Now over the second chord, which is a D flat major minor seven, he sings the word spectacle with the notes C, A flat, and E, which are the notes of an augmented triad. So against the notes D flat, F flat, A flat, and C, 
He is singing a C, A flat, and E. And all three of those notes are part of that D flat minor major seven chord. Because that E is enharmonic with F flat. So Mike Patton's melody does entirely fit over those two chords. It is entirely chord tones taken from the keyboard part. So we now know that one of these kids is doing his own thing, and it is the bassist. Now, another point of interest, Mike Patton does alter the melody notes slightly as the verse goes on. He not only adds a confusing harmony, but his melody also gets a bit more uncertain. It's hard for me to tell if he was changing the melody on purpose, or if he gets just a bit out of tune which would be very easy in this situation. And I have to say kudos to Mike Patton for being able to even hit those notes. The guy has an incredible ear, even without formal music theory training. But here is the most interesting thing about this Travolta verse melody. Remember how Mike Patton's vocal melody is outlining a D minor arpeggio? followed by an E augmented arpeggio? Folks, folks, tell me if you recognize these two chords. I'll give you a hint. It's another well-known Mr. Bungle song. Here they are again. Did you figure it out? Well, those are literally the exact two chords in the verse of Retro Vertigo. Well, remember what I was saying earlier about our tastes tending to be patterny? Okay then, I will let everyone know. And as if this wasn't all dissonant enough, there is yet another layer to the verse. There are various dissonant overdubs in the keyboards and guitars. For instance, in the second time around the verse, there is a guitar line that plays the notes C sharp, B flat, C, E, and that's one little phrase. And the next phrase goes C sharp, B flat, C, and G. And for the heck of it, if you arrange those notes vertically, you have G, B flat, C, C sharp, and E, which has a kind of diminished sound. Now, putting those notes back in their played order, the first two notes could imply a B flat minor chord, and the second two notes could imply a C major, hmm. which creates one of those Stravinsky Danny Elfman chord relationships, or the minor four, major five in harmonic minor. Now here's what that guitar melody sounds like if you put it over those two chords. And you can hear that chord progression in both Stravinsky's Firebird and Danny Elfman's Batman. But instead, in Travolta, that guitar melody is superimposed on the D minor major seven and D flat minor major seven. Now, how do those notes fit into those chords? Well, the first note, C sharp, is part of the D minor major seven. It is the major seven on top. But the B flat is not in the chord. And over the next chord, the C and E notes are part of the D flat minor major seven, which is spelled D flat, F flat, A flat, and C, because that F flat is enharmonic with E. Same sound, different name. And at the end of the phrase, that G clashes with the a flat in that D flat minor major seven. 
So maybe Trey was just plain old throwing in notes that were a half step off and clashy. And that's the end of the story. In my interview with him from 2017, when talking about this song, he does make reference to the band Stump. Now, I don't know how much of a direct influence Stump was on Mr. Bungle overall, but Stump does have a lot of seemingly clashing layers. And I'll put a link to their song Buffalo in the show notes. My final thoughts on this verse of Travolta? Well, I still love this piece of music. And I think the juxtaposition of bitonal or bimodal parts is really exciting. I love the idea that you can take two parts that are roughly centered on D and just go for it. Now, I'm not aware of much bitonal content in rock or pop music out there. It's probably because listeners tend to think it sounds bad. (laughs) But aside from Sarah Brand... One other example that jumped out at me years ago was a song by Arion with Devin Townsend on vocals from the album Human Equation. In the song called School, it seems Devin's vocals are in B Lydian and the guitar is in B Phrygian dominant. I think Devin does those sorts of things once in a while in his own music, too, but I don't recall exactly where. It might have been on his album Deconstruction. So give that a listen. Now, Travolta is far from being the most dissonant piece of music in history. So why do Mr. Bungle and this song stand out so much? Well, it's because rock audiences aren't exposed to that much harmonic dissonance on a daily basis. Most of the everyday wallpaper music is diatonic and has very few non-chord tones. But juxtaposing clashing melodies and chords like this has been going on for decades in classical music, which the young men in Mr. Bungle were studying at the time that they made this song. So for your further research, I will put some links to a few dissonant classical pieces in the show notes. And now let's follow this up with an appropriately paired analytical film analysis. The analytical film analysis of the week is Blue Velvet from 1986, directed by and screenwriting by David Lynch a painter whose parents moved him around a lot. It's starring Kyle McLaughlin, the guy from Showgirls, not to be confused with the night manager of Perkins in Venice, Florida, and also an incredible, unquestionable performance by Dennis Hopper. Let's start with a little history of me and Blue Velvet. My first viewing of Blue Velvet, I think I was probably 18, and I was maybe around 1993. I watched it in my mom's living room. I must have rented it at Blockbuster somehow on VHS tape. And the reason I watched it was because I found out it was sampled on the Mr. Bungle album. And I was so disturbed by this film, I just shut it off. I took a break and thought to myself, oh, maybe I shouldn't like Mr. Bungle anymore. My mom walked in during all the violence and had a talk with me, and she said, you know, it's not okay that people behave like that and treat each other that way. You shouldn't think that's normal. And for maybe a day or so, I thought, oh no, my favorite band, if they like this movie, they must be deranged criminal people or something. I don't want to be mixed up with that bad stuff. So I felt a combination of loss and fear. But I soon went back and watched it, and over the years, me and my friends got to quoting Dennis Hopper's character Frank Booth all the time and doing his hand gestures, and it became less of a serious, dark, scary thing for me. I've probably watched it a few times over the years since then, but this is the first time in a decade where I watched it all the way through and paid close attention and took notes. So here we go. The teaser is a harsh tonal shift from 
A beautiful town with happy music and flowers. There's a guy outside watering his plants. And then bad things start to happen. And we get a transition to the insects living underneath the lawn. I guess to symbolize that there's something bad hiding beneath the surface here. And by the way, does anyone know what type of beetles those were? Because I did a quick Google search and came up with nothing. And another question I have, what did Jeffrey's dad suffer from? Was it one of the insects? Like, did it crawl up and sting his neck? And also, the hose he's using gets tangled. So, did the water getting clogged represent the artery in his neck? So, was it a stroke? Well, it's hard to tell because when he's in the hospital, it looks like he's had both a tracheotomy and a neck surgery. And it's never clearly stated what happened to him. This is one of those clever David Lynch mysteries. You don't want to tell people everything. Just let them wonder. And my other thought was, why was that an important part of the story? Because it didn't need to happen for the sake of the plot. Jeffrey could have simply been in the town. But it certainly added some tonal darkness and dissonance. But hey, I am all for character-driven films and am actually a proud plot denier. After that, we get some mystical stuff. When Jeffrey finds the ear, it's as if we journey into the ear. And David Lynch said that the ear was an opening into another world. And a similar thing seems to happen in Mulholland Drive, almost two hours in, when the girls look into the mysterious blue box. And one of them vanishes, and the other gets sucked into it. At that point, the world flips sort of backwards. And characters change roles and names, and it becomes very hard to follow. It's almost a totally different story, but with the same actors. And portals to alternate universes are a common thing in David Lynch stories. Possibly my favorite moment in the film is when Jeffrey goes to the police station and gives the detective the ear. And Detective Williams reacts with amused awkwardness, like he's not surprised at all, which means there's something not right with him. You know, we would expect a different reaction. But Jeffrey also doesn't seem disturbed at all when he finds the ear. And maybe that's a clue that something is not quite right with Jeffrey. Because who would pick up an ear and take it with them to the police station? Now, I found this next bit surprising. Laura Dern's character Sandy is in high school, but she goes out to a bar with Kyle MacLachlan and drinks beer. And I thought, huh, maybe she has a fake ID, but she doesn't seem like the type to get a fake ID. So how is she being served alcohol in a bar? Well, I looked it up and the legal drinking age was 18 in the early 80s in South Carolina where this movie was filmed. So maybe David Lynch films are not so strange after all. And the other important woman in this story is Dorothy Valens, played by Isabella Rossellini. But here's the most important detail about her. She allegedly lives in Deep River Apartments on the seventh floor. But it appears from the early establishing shots, the building maybe only has four floors. And some shots look like three, and some shots look like four floors. Or at least we see no actual evidence. It actually has seven. And it also does seem seven stories would be pretty tall for the small town that they're in. And later when Jeffrey is walking up the stairs, we see him go up to what looks like the fourth floor and go in. Because for some reason the elevator was out of order. And why is that? Is it because... The stairs would better fit the mood? I think that's likely. And then again, thinking about this more, it might just be a crazy building where the floors are mislabeled. Anyway, here's some trivia. If you look very closely at the resident directory, you can freeze the frame, I think you can see there's a Lynch D who is listed. And I wouldn't put it past David Lynch to live in a building like that. Now, the most powerful tonal shift of all is when Frank Booth first enters Dorothy's apartment. The hand gestures and the explosive outbursts, 
and the dominance and control. It's very much drug addict behavior, at least the drug addicts that I have encountered. But it's never stated explicitly what type of gas he is inhaling. It's another one of those David Lynch vague things, so we're not sure what it's really doing to him. He transforms, but how? Before the gas, he wants to be referred to as Daddy. And after the gas, he becomes a character named Baby. So it seems to help him change. However, in another scene, he inhales it before becoming super macho and beating up Jeffrey. So the effects might not be consistent, much like other drugs. Now here's a puzzling detail which I spotted in Dorothy's apartment. Something is written way in the background on her bathroom mirror. And it's not written there when she walks in the first time and takes a shower, but it is written there at the end of that same long scene when she walks back in. And I wonder what it actually said. Was it a continuity issue or just an intentional David Lynch thing? And speaking of that scene in the apartment, it is long. Basically 14 minutes. So it's a compound scene with entrances and exits, kind of like a sitcom. It's broken into four parts, like little mini scenes. There's Jeffrey watching Dorothy, and then Dorothy catches Jeffrey, and then Frank Booth arrives and leaves, and then Jeffrey comes back out of hiding. And if that scene weren't broken up into those distinct mini scenes, it would be tough to sustain for that long. The same actors in the same location would be exhausting. Well, after that invigorating scene, Jeffrey wakes from a nightmare and he rolls over and looks at his wall and he has this creepy mouth thing hanging there. And we don't know where he got it or why he put it there. And I would assume this is Jeffrey's bedroom, which he left behind just recently when going to college. And he doesn't seem to have any possessions or collectibles. No books, nothing of personal interest. So that mouth thing is an unexpected decoration. And when he wakes up from the nightmare, the first thing he does is reach up at it. And he says, man, oh man. Now, along with all the dark imagery, David Lynch likes to superimpose naive innocence. The charm and specialness of normal, everyday, small-town people. And some of those in this film are the two dudes who work at the hardware store who go by Double Ed, and there's also an eccentric character making unusual motions outside a local store, and my favorite, a large man standing still on the sidewalk with his tiny dog with sunglasses at night. Also in the background of Ben's brothel, there are oddly shaped women standing around like lamps. Speaking of Ben's brothel, I feel like that room and Dorothy's apartment are the same place, but redressed. I'm pretty sure those were sets, and they sure were creepy rooms, weren't they? When Frank listens to music, it causes him to remember something. And it's something that is sad to him. Maybe someone he lost? And that sometimes transforms into rage. The people around him are like psychophants, which I think is pronounced sycophants for some reason. Anyway, they support his random emotional shifts and delusions. For instance, when Ben puts on that In Dreams performance, that song seems to deeply affect Frank. So I wonder, what is Frank's story? Something traumatic must have happened to him. What if this film had been written from Frank's point of view? Maybe someday there will be a prequel about how he turned into the monster that he is. And of course, that might ruin the mystery, but it also might not. Someone I know suggested that Frank is actually impotent, and that's why he's obsessed with effing. And every other word is the F word. Maybe someone cut a part of his body off with scissors which would explain his usage of them on others. So maybe he's compensating, projecting machismo and aggression, vroom-vrooming his car, flexing his muscles, getting in fights. 
But when it's time to actually have sex, maybe he can't. Because in the Dorothy scene, he only simulates it. Now, something else I found disturbing about this film, Jeffrey is simultaneously pursuing two different women. But this is probably a common thing in the real world. I knew a guy who had a girlfriend in each of the mini towns inside L.A., and I don't think any of the girlfriends knew. I always thought that was a bad life philosophy. Now, at one hour and 46 minutes, the plot takes back over, driving towards the resolution and the big action sequence. But here's another question I have. Why did Frank Booth wear a disguise as the character well-dressed man? Now, there seemed to be a linear error where Frank shows up at his apartment in the factory with the yellow man and they go inside. But then the yellow man comes out and meets with Frank as the well-dressed man. So why the disguise, especially when meeting with someone he knows well and was just with? Either I did not follow the plot, or this is one of those David Lynch mysteries that are never explained. If anyone knows, post a reply or send me a message. Speaking of the yellow man, there's that scene where he's been shot in the head and he's not quite dead because he's still standing and reacting to things. And he's obviously breathing, his fingers are wiggling, and not in some sort of accidental, we filmed this but didn't catch it kind of way. When his walkie-talkie goes off, his arm jerks and knocks over a lamp. So it's like he had just enough brain damage that it half killed him, but caused him to continue standing there. Now, thankfully, they rush through the final action scene shootout as a montage with some light ballad jazz music. And it was great use of montage, as having to sit through a long shootout would have been excruciating in my totally subjective personal opinion. Now, at the very end of that scene, when Frank Booth is dead, Laura Dern's character runs into Dorothy's apartment followed immediately by her detective dad, who has a gun. Now, why the heck would a detective let his daughter run in first? He should take some time and think about his priorities. And now for the big reveal. In one of the last shots of the Deep River Apartments, you can see six floors and possibly another floor that's semi-below ground. Well, I looked it up. And according to Apartments.com, that apartment building still exists and is only six floors. And I will share a link to the actual building in the show notes. Now, why did David Lynch explicitly want that building to have seven floors? Well, that's the kind of thing I'm going to wake up at night thinking about. Well, someone on IMDb suggested it's to stop fans from overwhelming the building, harassing people, and trying to break into Dorothy's apartment. Which makes sense. No seventh floor? Eh, okay, I guess we'll go home. Now for the final scene, we come back out of the ear, and now we see that it is Jeffrey's ear, and a mechanical robin appears in the kitchen window, it allegedly represents love, and it has caught a beetle, which represents evil. But as far as I've heard, bugs are not evil at all. They're animals who like to eat, just like robins do. And in my expert opinion, animals don't represent anything, unless we pretend they do. For a David Lynch film, the plot is mostly solid and clear. There are mysterious, surreal details, but those details are minor. Overall, I think the average viewer can understand what's actually happening. I mean, in the main plot. It's a detective story with a good guy and a bad guy, as opposed to Lost Highway or Mulholland Drive or Twin Peaks Season 3, which are all over the place and dreamlike. And that reminds me, I'll need to revisit Wild at Heart because I don't remember where that sits on the spectrum. Now, according to Wikipedia, the first cut of Blue Velvet was four hours long. And I was excited to find out that nearly an hour of deleted scenes are available on YouTube. Now, so many surreal scenes were deleted. 
You've got to see it to believe what David Lynch was doing back then. My favorite was the massively extended scene of avant-garde performers at the bar. Including that would have totally derailed the viewing experience. And whether that's good or bad, we don't know yet. It's surprising to me how far off those deleted scenes were story-wise and tone-wise from the final film. And you realize how much David Lynch was sort of fishing for the best ideas and much longer concepts before settling on what the movie would be. It was more like a long setup of a TV show with tons of backstory. And I think Dino De Laurentiis gave David Lynch the constraint to trim it down to two hours. So definitely go and check out those deleted scenes. And I will post a link in the show notes. One last thing I want to mention is the musical theme by Angelo Badalamenti. David Lynch was crazy about the Shostakovich 15th Symphony and asked Angelo Badalamenti to emulate it for the main theme. And listening closely, that Blue Velvet theme's melody lands on a D-sharp over an E minor chord, which creates an E minor major 7 chord. Wait a minute. That's the same type of chord from Mr. Bungle's song Travolta. Remember that one from this same episode, like six hours ago? In the end, I have to say, Blue Velvet gets better every time I watch it, which is not possible in reality because the film is exactly the same film each time. That is, unless George Lucas snuck in and fiddled with it, which is possible in reality. Anyway, it was easy to give this film five out of five stars and a little heart on Letterboxd. Okay, that's the end of this episode of the Carl King Podcast. Remember to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, or anywhere else you listen to these dang podcasts. And support the creation of more episodes by joining my Patreon for $1 or $5 per month. That's patreon.com slash Carl King. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. And as always, special thanks to my $51 a month patrons at the Special Illusionist level, Chubode and Hank Howard III. And thank you to all of the very good friends of Carl King for listening. And as I always say, okay then, I will let everyone know. <laughs>